Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 22nd of April and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 25th of April with me Michael Hewson. Um, it's been another choppy week of price action for not only European equity markets but um, also US equity markets in the wake of those comments from Jerome Powell, head of the Federal Reserve at uh, the IMF spring meetings on Thursday evening. US markets saw a late Thursday sell-off on the back of um, a much more perceivably hawkish Federal Reserve um, comments from Jay Powell that a 50 basis point rate hike was on the table. Um, the market reaction was somewhat surprising, I think, when you consider that essentially the base case has been for a 50 basis point rate hike um, as we as we look ahead to the May meeting. It's already priced in. I think markets are slightly getting ahead of themselves in terms of perhaps pricing in a much more aggressive Fed over the course of the next few months with Nomura actually calling for a 50 basis point rate hike in May and then two subsequent 75 basis point rate hikes um, over the course of the next two to three months after that. So essentially 200 basis points in the space of the, 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 next, the next three months. Well, if we look at what US Treasury yields are doing, that's already priced in anyway. So I don't really get the negative reaction. The Fed funds rate has already been raised the upper bound to um, 0.5. So essentially, we're already 2.25% above that level, uh, which suggests that markets are probably getting a little bit ahead of themselves, particularly when you consider that Fed policymakers can't even agree on what the neutral rate is because there are a, there are a wide range of estimates of where that is, whether it be two and a half percent or three and a half percent. It depends very much on who you speak to. If we look at the uh, the 10 year, what we are seeing is uh, once again, the yield curve is flattening out. The US 10 year is still below the levels that we saw at the beginning of this week, just below 3%, whereas the two year is now at 2.75%. So we've seen a much more distinct flattening of the yield curve over the course of the past couple of days uh, than was the case at the beginning of the week. So essentially, I think the market's starting price in a prospect of a policy mistake from the Federal Reserve um, in, in that they are potentially deliberately looking to slow the US economy and potentially tip it into recession. Um, compare that to um, the numbers that we've seen out of the UK this morning. US retail sales in March fell by 1.4%. I mean, that's a really, really big fall um, when you consider the estimates were for a decline of around about uh, minus 0.3%. And that's really, I think, filtered into a very sharp decline in the value of sterling. We've seen that this morning. A break below 129 and a half. Um, consumer confidence has slimmed, sunk back to levels in April that we last saw in July 2008. And that's not altogether surprising when you actually consider that um, UK consumers are going to have, are facing essentially the biggest fiscal squeeze in living memory. Um, April energy prices rose by 54 percent we're seeing national insurance tax rises um, kicking in uh, this month um, and we've seen a whole host of other um, price rises tax rises kick in starting in april so to a certain extent however you want to spin this this consumer slowdown is very much one of the government's own making and it's likely to make for a very difficult summer for business and consumers alike. And ultimately, it's going to make the Bank of England's decision 
in May that much more difficult. And I think we could well get a split between those members who may want to go down the 50 basis point rate, rate, rate hike route and those who would prefer to be much more cautious. But obviously, if you are much more cautious against a backdrop of a much more aggressive Federal Reserve, that is going to raise the prospect of a much weaker pound. And we're certainly seeing that. The break below 129 and a half today um, has seen the pound head lower. And the likelihood is we're going to head to 128.25 over the course of the next few days and potentially even fall as low as 125 over the course of the next few sessions. It really depends on how we react um, around this Fibonacci retracement level that I've drawn in here from the lows back in 2020 and uh, the peaks that we saw in June 2021. So we remain very much on a downward track when it comes to the value of the pound. We're getting lower highs and now we've got, an, we've got another lower low. So the line of least resistance, sadly, for the pound is very much for a weaker pound against the US dollar. What we've also seen this week is a slightly more um, aggressive narrative when it comes to ECB rate hikes, and we're seeing that play out in euro sterling. I still at the moment, I think very much um, with respect to the ECB and the Bank of England, we've got the FX equivalent of two drunks propping each other up at the bar. Um, the euro has gained against the pound. I think that's largely as a result of the fact that we've seen ECB policymakers this week become more vocal about a rate rise as soon as July. Um, we also saw a little bit of a softening in the headline rate um, of EU inflation from 7.5 to 7.4, while core prices fell back to 2.9. We've got flash CPI for April for the euro area coming out on Friday. Um, Friday the 29th of April and that is one particular number I've got my eye out for this week, this coming week. We've also got the French election, um, the outcome of that on Sunday on the 24th. That looks unlikely to spring a surprise. I think there had been some um, expectation that Marine Le Pen will close the gap on Emmanuel Macron and ultimately I think the choice, I think, between um, Le Pen and Macron is pretty much akin to, um, you know, it's it's really the least least popular option when it comes to who French voters want to vote for. Um, I think the biggest risk for Macron is that voters don't turn out, and Le Pen squeaks through that way. But I think. Um, Looking at the results of the debate that we saw between Macron and Le Pen on Wednesday night, I think it's quite likely that Emmanuel Macron will will will, will essentially, I think, win out in the end. I think if he doesn't, then obviously it will be akin to a, a, a political earthquake, akin to obviously Donald Trump being voted president of the US and obviously the UK Brexit vote. But I think the appetite for um, voters for a surprise is probably going to be slightly mitigated by the fact that there is a war going on between Ukraine and Russia. And I think the voters will probably prefer stability over disruption uh, going forward. So I think the geopolitics could well influence that voters in terms of the least of the least of two options, I think, there. We've got a Bank of Japan rate decision um, coming up as well on the 28th of April. And that's interesting in the context of the declines that we've seen in the Japanese yen. In terms of the euro sterling, before I go on to that, I think there is potential for further gains, but on, only in the context of the overall range that we've pretty much been in over the course of the past few weeks and months. So I certainly don't expect a shift in the overall narrative. I think the ECB is an unlikely to be able to hike as many times as markets are currently pricing in. But I think that is also true of the Bank of England as well. So I think it's really all about the dollar. And that's no better, I think, borne out than in the performance in the dollar yen that we've seen over the course 
of the past few weeks. The, the, the decline in the yen is likely to increase the pressure on the Bank of Japan to be slightly more hawkish when it meets later this week. But certainly when we look at the inflation numbers in Japan, they still remain very much on the low side. In March, headline CPI increased from 0.9% to 1.2. That's still well below the levels of 1.5% seen in February 2018. And with an inflation target of 2%, the Bank of Japan has only managed to briefly breach and or hit that target back in 2008 and for a few months in 2014 and 2015, when CPI briefly peaked at 3.7% before dropping back sharply. However, unlike then, we haven't seen a massive decline in the Japanese yen from where we were back in January, when we were around about 113, to where we are now, just shy of 130. So we could well see a big uptick in Japanese inflation, given the fact they're a big energy importer over the course of the next few months. And I think that's something that the Bank of Japan could be seriously underestimating. We have to go back, all the way back to 1998 um, to really sort of see um, a move anywhere near 140. And obviously the 2002 peaks of 135, March 2002, are the next key level for me when it comes to dollar yen. Um, we've broken above all these peaks through here. Um, 124, you know, 124, 125, 126. So on that basis, you would expect to see a little bit of a barrier at 130. But while we're above 125.80, the road is clear to a move towards these sorts of levels back at 135 back in 2002. So it's certainly worth keeping an eye out for the move in dollar yen when it comes to further gains for the dollar against the Japanese yen over the course of the next few um, weeks and months. Um, the weakness of the pound has mitigated some of the losses this week on the FTSE 100. We still remain fairly well supported, anywhere near 7,500, if we look at these series of lows all the way through here, um, even though we have seen a little bit of more of a sell-off today on the back of European markets. But once again, FTSE 100, pretty much like watching paint dry, we could fall back to around about 7,400. But that continues to look reasonably resilient. Um, and pretty much the same can be said for the German DAX. Once again, we are, str we are st struggling to really push higher. I probably really need to with redraw that line there. So I will do that right now for you. Fairly easy to do. Just select that high there, draw a line through those peaks there. And there we have it, another redrawn line. The thing with redrawn lines is that as long as you, you redraw them to a point whereby they're not completely new lines, and certainly in the context of the way I've redrawn those, we actually haven't closed above any of them. And if we look at the way the market has reacted here, um, we actually closed lower on the day, even though we tested above the originally drawn line, the line still remains pretty much intact. So there is an awful lot of uncertainty at the moment. Markets are finding it increasingly difficult to price the relationship between bond markets and equity markets, real yields are starting to edge back into positive territory and maybe the calculation could shift over the course of the next few sessions. But certainly I think it's getting much, much harder to make a case for higher equity markets. And certainly in the context of the more expensively, expensive parts of the market, we've seen that in the way the markets reacted to Netflix's results this week we could see further downward pressure come to bear in the in, in the coming week. So we've talked about the Bank of Japan, we've talked about the French election, we've talked about flash CPI, we've got US core PCE later this week, but I don't think that's really going to add to the overall narrative when it comes to the glide path for Federal Reserve rate hikes. So I think for me, as we look forward to this week, the focus very much needs to be on company 
earnings. Certainly, if we look at the NASDAQ and we look at the S&P 500, we can see that the likelihood is we may well see a retest of the lows that we saw over the course of the last few weeks, particularly if earnings disappoint. We look at the S&P 500, this 43,000, this 4,360 level is likely to be a key support level going forward after the failure to break the 200 day moving average yesterday. So next week is likely to be very much a key bellwether of where potentially we go to next because we've got a raft of earnings numbers. We can see them here. We've got UK banks, but it's also a big week for tech. Um, on, on, on Thursday, Snap um, could have could act could well act as a canary in the coal mine for Facebook and Google when it uh, when it comes to ad spend. So Alphabet and Meta. And let's not forget when we look at Facebook's numbers and the plunge that we saw in the aftermath of the release of their Q4 numbers and their guidance for Q1. We are now back towards the lows of that particular sell-off. Um, which we saw um, when we bottomed out in March. We've come back to revisit that in the aftermath of obviously what happened with respect to the SNAP results that came out um, on Thursday night. So that's I think that's gonna I think that's gonna be a very interesting, it's gonna be a very interesting number. Active user growth in terms of daily active user growth, monthly active user growth. But more importantly, what is the direction of travel for ad spend for businesses against a backdrop of a consumer, not only here in the, in the UK, but also in the US that's likely to find further pressure um, being brought to bear in the face of rising prices. So um, could we see another meta meltdown this week we will find out on the 27th of April when Meta release their first quarter numbers. We've also got numbers from Apple. Um, they've been fairly resilient despite the weakness across the board. Um, certainly Q1 revenue came in at a new record of $123.95 billion. Um, Q2 revenues are expected to slow to around $90 billion. So $90 billion for Q2. Um, Apple once again is refusing to offer guidance in line with previous quarters. So really, this is about what markets are expecting, not what Apple is expecting. And profits are expected to come in around about $1.42 a share. But it will be certainly interesting to see whether or not that resilience is maintained as we head into what is likely to be a significant cost of living squeeze. And the fact that China's economy is starting to show a significant evidence of slowing down. Amazon again seen it so oh, sorry what am i doing amazon I've just gone and selected the wrong chart there that's meta going back to amazon get the right chart that always helps we have broken lower when it comes to amazon um certainly been a fairly indifferent quarter since the company posted its q4 numbers back um, back in January, February. They have hiked their prices in the US, but so did Netflix, and we saw a significant slowdown there. I think investors will be hoping that um, web services, the cloud business, has continued to grow its revenue going forward. I think that's certainly a, certainly a key area that investors will be looking for a significant amount of strength as it looks ahead. Um, I think as we look ahead to um, the stock split that was announced in March and is set to take place on June the 6th, investors seem fairly relaxed about that. So I certainly don't think that there is likely to be anything in Amazon's numbers that are likely to, I think, upset investors going forward. I think the big question for me is um, whether or not we see a significant drop off in subscriber numbers on Amazon Prime 
because of the price hike that was announced on its US members. I think there is concern about the company's margins. So I think we need to pay particular attention to those numbers when they release them on the 29th of April. Also a big week for UK banks. Given how the shares, given how the US, the US UK consumer has been performing in February and March, I think the big question for me when it comes to UK banks is how lending, um, how lending has been going, particularly mortgages, because obviously we are now starting to price in the prospect, not only of higher mortgage rates, but also I think consumer discretionary spending is likely to be significantly lower. I think when we look at Lloyd's in particular, because obviously Lloyd's is very much exposed to the UK banking sector, it's really, I think, the big question is obviously how that will affect Lloyd's margins. We are finding resistance up near 48p. I think it's one of life's great mysteries why Lloyd's bank share price is still below the levels it was back in 2019 when it was much less profitable than it is now. But this is the world that we live in. And unfortunately, we have to deal with the world as it is, not as the world, not as the world as we'd like it to be. So I think, uh, you know, as, as we look ahead to, Q, to Q2 to and Q3, I think the big concern, I think, for shareholders of Lloyd's and any of the other banks is what is, what does a diminution in margins mean for a potential further buybacks for the dividend? Certainly, I think there are high expectations in terms of loans, loan growth, business lending, mortgage lending, effect on margins. Higher rates is generally fairly good for banks, but the problem is if people aren't if people aren't willing to borrow, then obviously those margins are. Um, those margins are neither here nor there. So significant challenges for UK banks. If we look at Lloyd's, obviously we've seen a nice little uptick there. There's certainly potential for further gains there. If we look at, say, for example, Barclays, it's a completely different story. We are approaching a fairly key trend line support. They've had obviously problems of their own with respect to the new CEO, Venkat. The honeymoon is well and truly over for him after his competence was called into question, after it was revealed the bank was facing a 450 million pound hit and a regulatory investigation over some of its trading products in the US. In light of the numbers that we've seen out of US banks, you know, what does that mean for their fixed income revenues, their equities business, investment banking, um, advisory fees and other capital markets activity going forward? Is all the bad news priced in? Are we likely to see a little bit of a rebound when they report their first quarter numbers on the 28th of April? And we've got NatWest Group numbers on the 29th. So let's have a quick look at NatWest Group's um, chart here. Again, fairly seen a fairly decent um, recovery off the lows back in March. Can that be sustained? Certainly, I think in terms of valuations, it's one of the cheaper UK banks relative, say, say for example, HSBC, um, which is also reporting its first quarter numbers on the 26th, and particularly its Asia operations will be a particular area of interest given the COVID lockdowns that we've seen across China and obviously business activity there. So we've got HSBC on the 26th, Lloyd's on the 27th, Barclays on the 28th, and NatWest on the 29th. We've also got four year numbers from Sainsbury's, in the wake of the Tesco numbers um, earlier this month, it's highly unlikely that Sainsbury's will be able to get anywhere anywhere near to matching Tesco's numbers. And obviously the cost of living squeeze there will impact its margins. We've seen an increase in salaries from Sainsbury's. But overall, if we look at where Sainsbury's shares are relative to where they've been, you, you sort of could argue that perhaps um, some of the some of the worst news has perhaps been already priced in. But again, you know, who knows when it comes to um, a supermarket price war? It's signed up to the real living wage, a pledge to pay all of its workers over £10 an hour. And um, it's facing a scrap with the likes of Aldi, Lidl, 
um, Waitrose, Tesco's um, in terms of competing for staff. So it's going to be a very difficult retail outlook going forward. We've also got Associated British Foods, Primark on the 26th, and they're reporting their first half numbers. One silver lining has been the inability of oil prices to significantly rally above $110 a barrel this week. Now, that would suggest that perhaps we're starting to see an element of demand destruction. We certainly saw evidence of that in the latest UK retail sales numbers. So in that context, perhaps we could well see prices at the pump start to edge back down again. That's not necessarily a good thing, demand destruction, but ultimately I think that's the only way that we're likely to see inflationary pressure start to diminish. So certainly want to, would like to see a move back to $100 a barrel, which should hopefully ease the squeeze on uh, consumers' um, wallets going forward. Um, I think pretty much covered most of everything that I need to talk about this week. It's certainly going to be a packed week. It's likely to be a significant um, test for US markets in particular, which have remained very resilient to some of the um, geopolitics and the macro outlook going forward. The bigger question is whether or not um, any disappointment that we see this week will prompt further declines in equity markets, um, particularly against the backdrop of a much more hawkish Federal Reserve going forward. So that's it for this week. Thanks very much for listening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you have a great weekend. Speak to you all same time, same place next week. Thank you very much for listening.